tis the season, I guess. The last round of several weeks, we've sort of been in a, um, a small series of messages, though I didn't intend it to be that way, but as some of the things that God has brought into my life um, just led me in this direction, I guess this is the conclusion of it, but two weeks ago we looked at one of my favorite verses, and that is to be quiet or be still. Know that I am God. But that message dealt with a challenge, but what do we do when God is seemingly silent? When we're not sure God is here, and we did a whole message on that. Last week, we looked at when concerns come into our life, some may refer to as a test of faith, and we don't do so well. We don't pass the test, if you will. We looked at Paul's scripture, said that's what, that which I want to do, I don't do, and that which I don't want to do, I do. This morning we're looking at a question that, well, I entitled the message, How? Why? Maybe be opposite, why and how? Why does it seem that good things happen good people. Or, in essence, you may understand that, but why do bad things happen to good people? And does it make sense? Scripturally, biblically, we know that God is all loving, that God is all powerful, that God is all caring, that He, he understands it all, and we do believe that God is in control. But when we say that, we can't help but being, showing our human side, and we take a step backwards, then we say, why then does bad things happen to good people? And sometimes to try and understand that, we want to know how it happens. Why does God allow it? So this morning, first of all, let's read Ephesians chapter 5, 18 through 20. We're going to try to look at some factors that's involved when bad things happen to good people. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 18 through 20. Do not be drunk or on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Speak to one another with psalms, hymns, spiritual songs. Sing and make music in your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything. You know, may not have had too much problem with verses 18 and 19. <laughs> Do not be drunk. But be filled with the Spirit. Let me tell you this, folks. Have you ever just been so filled with the Spirit, so ecstatic about life and knowing that your eternal destination is home, that somebody thinks you're on something? Isn't that awesome? I love when that happens. Say, yeah, I'm on Jesus. I took another one of those Jesus pills, and man, I'm just sort of losing. So we understand that. It says to speak to one another with psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, sing and make music in your heart. I love that. I mentioned victory in Jesus, and I got a victory in Jesus was saying this week. That's pretty good. How great they are. Anyway, um, <laughs> but oh, when you sing those songs, folks, you know, there were times in my life, and maybe times in your life, you just sort of sang the songs, but man, because of your involvement with Jesus Christ, those songs, man, man, they go right to the heart. He came and died for me in victory in Jesus. And when you sing them, you just, oh, man, I just, I want to sing them louder and louder, but I don't want to throw off the praise. So I don't, I don't do that, but uh, I sing out loud because we sing from the heart. <coughs> I've told you the story probably of Pat Dodson many times. Pat is on this 
and I, I encourage you to put him on your prayer list. Pat is probably in his final months of, of life. One of the most, uh, one of the Christians that besides my family had the biggest impact in my life. But I tell you what, Pat cannot carry a tune in a bucket. He is, he's not, he's not a bad singer, he's a horrible singer. <laughs> And I'm not so sure that many times before that I was not standing beside him and even angels came down and said, why did you mention this? <laughs> but let me tell you, some of the most beautiful songs I've ever heard sung just standing beside someone was from none other than Patty Sam. Because you knew that he was singing it right from his heart. And it didn't matter. And you know, the Bible says make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Hallelujah. <laughs> but man, he would sing out to his Lord and say, Jesus Christ. He's about to meet him face to face now. So we understand this. Speak to one another with psalms, hymns, spiritual songs. Sing and make music in your heart to the Lord. We've just done that. Always giving thanks. Yes, Father God, I'm just always so thankful for all you do. Always giving thanks to God for everything. Whoa. Man, you were on a roll. I mean, it was just, it was clicking along. And man, I was just thankfulness and singing to God was pretty awesome. And now it's telling me to be thankful for, to God in Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for this day. Father, we just pray that you move in an awesome and powerful way, Lord. Father God, no one needs to hear from me. I'll just mess it up. But Father, we do need to hear from you and through the movie of the Holy Spirit. So I just pray, Father, that you would just move in a powerful way. Use me as that conduit. And Lord, I pray now that I may decrease, that you may increase in Jesus' name. Amen. Number one, when bad things happen, and in essence, the title could be, How Do We Give Thanks in Everything? Well, in understanding what happens, or how it happens, or why it happens, it gives a better understanding of why we should be thankful in everything. Obviously, when this was recorded to the church in Ephesus, it was not one of those, well, I just want to mean something like that. It's God's holy word and it's power. Number one, there is the sin factor. Number one, when bad things happen to good people, and how we're able to still give thanks in the midst, uh, midst of that, we have to remember the sin factor. Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5, verse 12 says this. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin, and in this way death came to all men, because all sin. Because of Adam and his sin, we have, uh, we have all sinned. We've come into this world. We are sinners. We understand that. We, we talk often about uh, for uh, we are saved by faith. We've all sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. We understand that. It is a sin factor that causes things to happen. Job chapter 14, verse 1. Oh, okay, good. Uh, just, I want to make sure. Sometimes I'm spending time on pages, and it's sitting right up there. And, uh, so uh, there's a lot of verses. So she put that. It's there now? Thank you. Uh, Y'all just help me on my end. Uh, that'd be great. Man born of a woman is a few days and full of trouble. Oh boy, isn't that the breath of fresh air? <laughs> well, folks, there's a lot of truth to that. We as believers go through some tragic things sometimes. And God's not saying I'm going to pull you away from all of that. I'm going to walk with you through it. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 3. Should I? I feel like I'm on Jeopardy. No, 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 no. All of us also live among them at one time, gratifying the craving of our sinful nature, following its desires and thoughts like the rest. We were by nature 
objects of wrath. We have all sinned. The world is full of sin. All that's happening to tragedy in the worlds today and, and people destroying one another's lives, it is all a sin factor. Romans 8, 21 says this, that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought to the glorious freedom of the children of God. The world is decaying because of sin. Our bodies are decaying because of sin. We have floods, tornadoes, earthquakes, and sometimes, folks, we look back and we think, how in the world, why would this happen? And you see people's lives ripped to pieces. But folks, it is all, in some of the cases, it is a sin factor. In those cases, I believe it is a sin factor. Sometimes, bad things happen to good people because this world is full of sin. And it brings decay and destruction on everyone, even into the world. Sometimes people say, well, what have I done? Is it my sin? Remember back in Job, they went to him and said, listen, Job, you had to have done something. God is, God is whacking you. And you just got to figure out what you've done wrong because you're getting what you deserve. Folks, that is not always or very seldom the case in when bad things happen to good people. It's not about getting what we deserve. It is a sin factor. And we live in a sinful world. And bad things happen even to God's people in this world. Number two, it's a discipline factor. This does happen. Hebrews uh, chapter 12. Again, verse 4. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And you have forgotten the word of the encouragement that addresses you as a son. My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline. Do not lose heart when he rebukes you, because the Lord disciplines those he loves. And he punishes everyone he accepts as a son. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as a son, for what son is not disciplined by his father? If you are not disciplined, and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are illeg illegitimate children and not true sons. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the Father of our spirit, to the Father of our spirits, and live? Our fathers disciplined us for a little while as they thought best, but God disciplines us for our good, that we may share in His holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Therefore, strengthen your feeble arms and weak knees. God disciplines us. Now, we could go, probably go around this room and uh, with people that are my age, 30 and above, that have uh, have been disciplined. Thank you for that. Uh, that have been disciplined uh, by your parents in my generation. They truly believed in spare the rod and spoil the child. Amen. Yeah. Um, and I know Mike talks about getting some, but I'm, I'm pretty sure he deserves every one of them. Just I don't. I, don't uh, I know him now. I didn't know him back then, but I didn't think at the time probably that uh, it wasn't well warranted. Uh, but we discipline our children. Now, one thing, and I've asked my mother about this. Well, sorry, she'll be 90 in July. And I've asked her about this. Did you ever have your parents say, if you don't quit crying while they're disciplining you, I will give you something to cry about? Mm -hmm. You already are. What? I mean, you're doing it right now. Why, why does it need to be more? But sometimes, folks, things come into our life because we're not where we need to be with the Lord. So God does use that to discipline us, to bring us back into fellowship. We as parents, when I disciplined my child, I thought I was doing right and doing well. And I don't know about you, probably so, most parents, 
Sometimes you discipline, discipline your child and you go in the other room and think, hey, did I do the right thing? Especially when they say, well, can I go to so-and-so's house and for whatever reason you've said no because maybe they, they've done bad. And it's hard for children to understand at the time, but you're going the whole time saying, I wish I could let you go, but I've got to, I've got to stand on this principle, this discipline. And it's best for you in the wrong way. God di disciplines out of love. And, and that, uh, you know, when we talk about discipline and things like that, <coughs> now we see so much of it that's not out of love. And, and sometimes parents discipline because the child is just sort of getting in their way. And it's not based upon love. It's, it's, it's tragic. And we see that. And sometimes when we talk about discipline, it's almost like, be careful now, you're... You're talking about beating a child. No, not at all. I'm talking about loving a child through discipline. And I'm not going to be writing any books about that. But God uses that to as a discipline factor. <clears throat> God deals with us really in three ways. As sinners, as sons, and as servants. As sinners, he died on the cross for us. And we sing praises unto him that for his work on the cross. As sons, he dis deals with us through discipline sometimes. A child that is not disciplined has a long, hard life waiting to him. And then he deals with us as servants in heaven. He'll stand before, he'll stand there and say, this is my child. Enter into heaven. So there's a sin factor, there's a discipline factor, there's a dependency factor. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Verses 4 through 12. Two. Excuse me. Two. Two. Two what? <laughs> Y'all really are very helpful. <laughs> well, I looked at four and I thought, I can't start there. It starts with was. <laughs> I'm just going to have to y'all. I'm going to start with verse one. It's not even <laughs> I must go on boasting, although there is nothing to be gained. I will go on to visions and revelations from the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago were caught up in the third heaven. Whether it was in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that the man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know, but God knows, was called up to paradise. He heard, the, heard inexpressible things that man is not permitted to tell. I will boast about a man like this, but I will not boast about myself except about my weaknesses. And this is what Paul's experience. There's a lot here that I'm leaving that could go on. If you want uh, further explanation on this, see Billy with it right after the service. He'll be happy to tell you about Paul. I don't know. Uh, uh, even if I should choose to boast, I would not be a fool because I would be speaking the truth. But I refrain, so no one will think more of me than is warranted by what I do or say. Now watch this. To keep me from both becoming conceited because of these surpassingly great revelations, there was given me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan, to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away, but he said, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest in me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecution, in difficulties. For when I am weak, listen to this. Oh, I love it. For when I am weak, then I am strong. When I am weak, then am I strong. Sometimes test comes in. Sometimes good things happen to bad people. And it's a dependency <coughs> factor to always keep us reminded that we must be dependent upon God. And God allows things to come into our life to remind us of that. Paul was reminded because of all that God had, had done and brought him in and, and told him there's some things that you don't need to tell. 
smashed. That's really more of a dagger and knife. We say a thorn, we think, oh, that bitch, that hurts a little bit. He was, he was given some, uh, a, a strong thorn in the flesh or a dagger in the, in the flesh, if you will. Uh, some people believe it's his eyesight, other people believe other things. But uh, nonetheless, Paul was given this to keep him humble, keep him dependent upon him. Let's face it, folks. If God didn't bring some tough things into our lives, we may have, we may learn to not be so dependent. But when trouble comes, praise be unto God, we know we need to come to Him. So the fourth, fourth one is a learning factor. And I know many of you in this congregation have been through some devastating things. And they have become a learn. It was a learning factor for you. Psalm chapter one nineteen verse sixty seven. Listen to this. Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I obey your word. Before I was afflicted, I went astray. I did my own thing. But now I obey your word. Look at verse 71. Listen now. <laughs> if you're a believer, you understand this. If you just read it and you really don't understand, I'll sort of like that song. Some I can't remember the exact words, but some people found it strange. But uh, I understand because he's my savior, something to that effect. Beautiful song. Love that song. But listen to this now. It was good for me to be afflicted. Serious? It was good for me to be afflicted so that I might learn your decrees. And folks, let me tell you, when you have a time where you say, listen, we're just going to go around and talk about what Jesus has done for us. 99% of the time, people are saying, let me tell you when this came in. And I'm sold out to you. We as a general rule don't go out and say, listen, man, this is one of the best things of my life, man. We, we have wonderful days. And, and those are great. And we thank God for them. And we should. But it's in those afflictions that people say, let me tell you how great they are. Let me just tell you. So sometimes it's a learning factor. What is God's plan for you? Is it for health? Listen, you go on TV and you hear preachers proclaim, listen, if you will turn your life over to Jesus Christ, you will be healthy. And if you believe enough, if you have enough faith, anything that's wrong with you will be taken away. Folks, I don't think you can find that in Scripture. God does move in some miraculous and supernatural ways. And I truly believe that God still works miracles. And I still pray for God to work miracles in people's lives. And sometimes he does that. Is it about wealth? You'll hear preachers talk. And you can be, they, we call it sort of a healthy and wealthy ministry. You can be healthy and you can be wealthy. Give it all to Jesus Christ. And I want to try something. If every one of you would give me $100 every week, just to me, not to church, just to me, let's see. Now, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> God's not so concerned so much. Don't, don't follow me on this one, that you're healthy and that you're well. What's God's plan for you? For, for you to be a service? Well, that could be. And God can make you healthy and wealthy as well. I'm not saying God doesn't do that. But his number one goal is found in Romans, I think, 8, 28 through 29. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son. God's desire is for you to be like Jesus. And that is his main plan. That is his main goal. 
And sometimes we have learning factors that come into our lives. Sometimes tough things come to our life so that we'll ultimately be more like Jesus. There's a patience factor. How many of you need patience? <laughs> All right. So some of you told the truth. Others chose not to. I mean, um, <laughs> it's a challenge, isn't it? We live in a day and age where everything's being now, 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 now. If you don't get it now, let's move on. Don't have time to pull with you. I tell you what's fun sometimes if you're not in a hurry. Go to Wally World and watch when they have two lines open and 48 people waiting to check out. <laughs> I have heard people aloud speaking, making suggestions on what Wally World could do at this very moment. Some were profitable, some were not very nice. I did hear a comedian say one time that if you're in the bank waiting for a line, in line, just like, like you're messing with something, ask the person in front of you if they know how to get a gun unjammed. And then, and they said, usually the line disperses and you're able to go right on up. Just, no, that's not going to cost you a thing. Just keep it back in the room. Psalm 27, verse 14 says this. This is so easy to read. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take, take heart. And wait for the Lord. Sometimes challenges come into our lives and God is practicing patience with us. We say, why isn't God doing anything? He's doing something. He's practicing building your patience. So there's a sin factor, the discipline factor, the dependency factor, the learning factor. The patient factor, there's the ministry factor. And I reference this slightly, but 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, when I spoke about many of you guys have been through a lot of things with the Lord. Some of them are very dark times in your life. And sometimes God brings things into our life for a ministry factor. Factor. And I've personally seen many of you use this. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. Praise be to God, the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles, listen now, so that we can comfort those in trouble with the comfort we ourselves have received. Sometimes you walk through some very dark times. God didn't leave you alone in that. God walked you through it. And then in turn, someone will come up to some, someone will go over here, someone say, I dealt with something like that. And you're able to say, let me tell you what Jesus did. You're also able to be just so open and honest and also say, you know what, that was such a dark time in my life. And I had the challenges, and I asked why, and, and I didn't know where it was at, and I searched for him, and, and it seemed like he wasn't there, but like the, the old story of the footprints in the sand, I realized, especially when I looked back, that God was carrying me. And the whole time I was saying, God, where were you at? But the whole time I was in his arms. And you're able to share with someone that I walked down that road. And folks, that means a whole lot more than a preacher man coming by and saying, God is good. Not that it's old, not bad for a preacher to do that and share a prayer, but I tell you what, it makes a lot of difference when somebody comes up to you and you're going through some trouble and they say, I've been there. I've been there. I say this often, or I say this, I think, to you guys often, that I, something I try not to say I'm very, very careful about saying this. I know how you feel. 
Have you ever sometimes, and then almost all the times people are doing this in a, in a very nice way, trying to have compassion, to show compassion for you. But sometimes, folks, in, in those times when it's been dark and somebody says, I know how you feel, I want to look up and say, no, you don't. No, you don't. been at those times in my life that God has led people into my life that can say I do know how to feel. And let me tell you how I got So sometimes it's a mystery factor. Sometimes it's a glory factor. When we suffer but we keep praising God, it gives Him glory. Do you want people to think you're a nutcase? Uh, nuts don't sound good. I don't know. I apologize for that. That was not what. But when you want people to think you've lost, no, that's all the same. <coughs> Listen, my friends. When everything's going well in your life, and you rightfully so are being thankful to God about it, people really don't. things are going well, when things are going bad in your life, and you're still saying, I'm following Jesus, then they want to know what makes you act like you. There's a big difference. And sometimes it's not easy, and sometimes you come to worship service, and you're praising God, but still, God... Yeah, if this is a test, take me out. I got it. You can find that in 1 Peter chapter 4. The last factor is the mystery factor. And folks, sometimes it comes down to this. I believe, I think I'm right, that Billy Graham in speaking to some in dealing with the 9-11 tragedy said that people want him to come up and explain God and why it happened. And if I'm correct, if not, I apologize, but uh, Billy Graham said, I cannot tell you. Isaiah chapter 55, verses 8 and 9 says this. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declare the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. And then a very strong passage. Uh, passage or scripture verse Deuteronomy chapter 29 <clears throat> verse 29 the secret thing for long <laughs> Sometimes it's a mystery fact. And we don't know. We're not God. And we don't understand. I think we'll understand it better by and by, as the song says. Warren Wiersbe says, we do not live by explanations. We live by promises. The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things revealed belong to us and to, in our to our children forever, that we may follow all the words of the law. The secret things belong to the Lord. I'm going to close with this. In Daniel chapter 3, there's a story of the fiery furnace. And if you've been in church much time at all, you know the story of the fiery furnace. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. King Nebuchadnezzar had built uh, 
an idol, if you will, and said, you got to bow down and worship it. And they said, we're not going to do it. Or uh, someone came up and said, hey, you have three Jewish people here that uh, they're not doing that. And they're in a leadership role in the group. So he called them up and said, hey, you guys not doing that? You know what the, the uh, penalty for that is, is to be thrown into the fiery furnace. And they said in Daniel chapter 3, and I encourage you to read that. In essence, they said that God is able to keep us safe, to pull us from the fire. They went on to say that he is, but their first response, he said, and they said, it doesn't matter if he does or he doesn't. I'm sold. I'm so out to him. But in the first section, they say that God is able. They do go on and say that God will do it, but at the first they just said, listen, I know that God is able. And if he so chooses to do it, he will do it. But if he doesn't, I'm walking. And sometimes all those other factors boil down to the last one. The mystery factor. God, I don't know. I don't understand. And one of my favorite illustrations that I use from time to time, that if you want to be serious with God, and use this sometime in, in telling you people to come to Jesus Christ, this can be this can steer your way. If you go to buy a car, you have to sign a bunch of papers. And you sit down and take it to a different person in a different office to do this. And they say, sign this, this is what this means. Sign this, this is what it means. This means we're going to do this. This means we're going to do this. And when you get through, you're not sure if you bought two or three cars or just one car. You're not sure how much a month you're going to pay almost. And, and it's just all over the place. How many of you would go into a car lot and say, I want to purchase this car? They say, here's a contract. It's blank. And you say, they said, just sign it. We'll fill in all the other. Oh, 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 I'm not as dumb as I look. My friends, really, in the walk with God, it's saying, God says, I don't want to sound like a contract, but in the illustration, here's a contract. You sign it that you're going to follow me. But God, it's plain. I'll fill in the rest. You trust me. You walk with me. And I will always be there. Friends, has our contract with God gotten all messy? Have we begun to cut deals with God? Maybe today is the time to go back and say, God, please, Father God, give me that blank contract again. I'm ready to sign. You fill in everything else. But I will follow. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for this day. Lord, we thank you for your word. Father, we have so much to be thankful for. Yes, Father, there's times that things happen in our lives that we don't understand. And, and Father, sometimes it just doesn't seem fair. We looked at some of the factors and Father, sometimes it falls under that mystery factor, but Lord, today, today, I'm sure there's many here that will just talk with you right where they're at. I'll be at the front, right where they're, during the song, I'll be at the front. Father, if anyone wants to talk with me, but Father, maybe we just need to say, Lord, I've just sort of messed up the contract, and I've written in so many things. Lord, I just want to wipe it clean. Just sign it. You fill it all in, God. I choose. I will walk with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand. We're going to sing.